can hear though. Yeah, you can. But I had the open mic and the loud side, so the sound came through. Okay. And I still picked it up on the mic, but instead of using the camera, I can use this. Gotcha. But we just ended up doing that. Okay. specifically about the data presentation you're going to see from launch monitors and what it all means, going through the five most important pieces of data that every single person in this room should understand. And then I'm going to be coming back up to speak a little bit later. I'm going to talk to everybody specifically about the do's and don'ts of training with technology, understanding the limitations and understanding how to read the information and how to incorporate the feedback that you're getting from all these wonderful technology tools. So we're going to get right to it, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Henry Brunton. Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me back there in the back rows? Liam, congratulations to you and all your partners for uh, just a magnificent facility. I've been teaching golf indoors, makes me feel old to even say, since the early 80s in the Ottawa Valley. And I can tell you the old indoor facilities we used were prehistoric compared to this. So boy, has it ever come a long way, and this is an amazing, world-class facility. We're so lucky to have it, and I think this discussion about how to train indoors and how to get better, I think it'll be a lot of fun. We're going to all talk about how to make changes, just maybe talk about ideas that uh, might spur some action in your parts. Uh, Larry's going to talk about technology. We'll have a time for some questions to answer, so it's great to have people love golf uh, to be here and really have that discussion. It's easy to lose track of really what this game's about. And this game's about putting this ball in the hole. Now, some people might be here for different reasons. There are people that we meet that want to have a perfect looking swing. That's okay if that's what you want to do. But for those that are really invested in trying to play better, don't forget it's about putting this ball into the hole. And a lot of people lose sight of that uh, when they're trying to get better. Before you begin working on putting it in the ball, ball the hole faster, it's really important to take shape of where your game is right now. So the first thing that we would encourage people to do in this modern world of getting better at golf is to walk up those stairs where Dr. Nick Martichenko is and have a body assessment, have a physical screen, an assessment of what your body can and can't do so that your body can do the things that you'd like it to do. Very important. Make sure that you don't have any injuries that might be debilitating you now or in the future. Get rid of any stiffness or pain that might be there. So that first physical piece is really important. And if you're committed enough to follow a regimented strength and conditioning program for golf, you're going to see results short term and long term. But the physical piece is not the panacea. It's the foundational piece. You can have the most fit athletes in the world, but if they can't put that ball in the hole, that's what the game's about. If you've been watching the big break, you're watching a little genius, James Lepp. I had the pleasure to coach and support James for seven years. Great to see him back playing. What a genius. He even created a new shot. I think he's going to use a new shot. Saucer. A saucer pass. That could catch on. It might become a, a shot that people, an accepted shot in golf. But what it does work, especially for us hockey players. But going back to when James was a young guy and, and a very small kid compared to the big guys he was competing with, he always wanted to put the ball in the hole. His, his eyes were burning to put the ball in the hole. So don't forget to put the ball in the hole. That's what it's about. Please remember that there's an old saying, we learn to ski in summer and to play golf in winter. We learn to ski in summer and to play golf in winter. So this is a perfect time to think about our games, figure out what needs to get changed, what we'd like to change, and then how do we do it? So. I'd invite you to, first of all, 
find someone like a Dr. Nick Martichenko to look at your body to make sure that what you want to do, you can do, and that that piece is all aligned with your goals. And it's really important to realize that in getting better, that a lot of people think that there's something called muscle memory. <coughs> muscle memory does not exist. Muscles are as dumb as that golf shaft. Muscle memory does not exist. What we have is what's called a kinesthetic memory, and so we have to learn to use improved motor patterns to get the results that we want to get. Larry's going to talk later about what the fabulous technology can do to give us feedback on club delivery and where the ball's going. This game is about getting control of the golf ball, keeping control of your emotions, managing the course, managing yourself, and putting it in the hole. But a lot of people come into a facility like this and they forget why they're there. It's easy to get lost in the why are you here. So you want to figure out what are the one or two, maybe three things that you could do to become a better golfer. And again, I would go back to the first foundational piece. Make sure your body can withstand whatever it is you're asking it to do. We know that the faster that you can swing the club in balance is going to give you the best possibility for, of course, energy and distance. Distance is a huge factor. Don't forget that distance is supported by equipment. So you see we have a world-class facility here where you can test equipment, make sure the shafts are correct, make sure that that, that whole piece is all set up for you. I noticed some uh, exciting to see some young athletes here, so make sure as they're developing as, as young players that the equipment develops with them. As people on the other side are maybe not as strong as they once were, make sure their equipment keeps following their development. So make sure your equipment is really, really dialed into what you're attempting to do. So again, I encourage people to find one or two things to do over the winter season to measurably improve and give it the energy and the time and the repetition that it really needs. And it needs significant amounts of repetition. No one quite knows how much, but it is significant to make a motor pattern change that will be reliable and understood when you transfer it to the outdoors. So for example, if a person has a grip that might not be exactly what they'd like it to be, I'd encourage you to work with a coach, whether it's Reggie Millich here or Kyle or, or any of the folks that are on staff here, Leah, whomever your coach is in your own club, Try to work with a coach to get the feedback and guidance that you need. Make sure that's clear. If you have an issue, for example, with a grip, it would be easy to neglect the fact that this game is strongly rooted in the fundamentals. So over the winter season, if you could make sure that your grip, if it's an issue for you, is much better, that's going to give you the best possibility of better club delivery, ball contact, ball control when the season starts, but how the heck do you do it? So find out exactly what a grip should be like, what it feels like, and have a tool like this one where you can practice and build that pattern, whatever that pattern might be. So fundamentals, 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 super important. I'd encourage you to make that maybe one of your two pieces over the winter, depending on your game and how it all is. We've got a guy like Dave Bunker, a world-class amateur. Dave almost made the cut in the paint open at St. George's. He's won several national championships. What are the one or two things that he wants to get better at to put his ball in the hole a little bit faster? Everyone's at a different stage. It's important to be very pinpointed in your approach to what it is you should be doing. So the fundamentals are really important. So if you're practicing indoors, get a tool like this one. Make sure that you're working on your grip and just let your brain get acclimated and learn how to make this club work with this new pattern. It takes a long time. Give it the repetition that needs it. It needs a lot of repetition. It isn't one or two times. It's many, many times with lots of repetitions. Uh, in golf, we have three things. We call them the big three that are the biggest determinants for scoring. The first skill set, and you'll ask that question, what do you suppose the number one skill set in ball hitting, or in this game, is that makes the most difference for scoring, the biggest influence on scoring? Actually, it's not putting, it's 
driving. If you can't drive, then you will not score. So you need to make sure that you drive the ball into play. It depends on the level of play that you're playing at, but it has to be at a baseline measure. So for a young player uh, that's going into NCAA Division I golf, we know that they have to have a ball speed of 155, would be sort of minimum baseline. You've got to have a driver that makes the ball fly the right trajectory and spin. They've got to be able to fly at 250 to compete at that level. If you're a 14 handicap right now and you want to be a 10 handicap, maybe your ball speed's got to be a minimum of 140. You've got to have appropriate speed. You have to have appropriate control of the golf ball to minimize mistakes and to be in position to score. A lot of people erroneously erroneously believe that fairways and regulation equate to a lower score. That is not quite correct. People score when they get the ball into position to score. So hitting it in the fairway, of course, that would be a nice thing for everyone, but you want to be in position to hit the greens in regulation. So if you're trying to break 80, you need roughly eight greens in regulation around. If I have a, a, a board later, I'll maybe show a little equation. So, Driving is hugely important, so make sure you have a driver that fits. Work, that's a great thing to work on your driving. Larry will talk about ways that technology can support that. Putting is the second most important skill set. 40% of our shots are going to be putts no matter what skill level you play at. Most people, if you study them, when they're not putting well, they've got very quick head movement before it should move a good way to practice your putting. So you can come in here, for example, to look off the lab and say, one of my two things is going to be to train myself to keep my head still. So you could do something like take a coin, place it on the ground, place the golf ball on the coin, and train yourself maybe from four or five feet to putt it and see if you can honestly read the ear of that coin after the putt. Sounds simple. It actually is simple. But to do it repetitiously over time, you'll train yourself to keep your eyes and your head down where they should be. So it isn't about making wholesale dramatic changes. It's about finding out what your strengths are, keeping those strong, identifying key areas that might be, not might be, in the opinion of your coach would be critical for you to get better. So it could be a fitness movement piece, someone like Dr. Nick. It could be an equipment piece. It could be a short game piece, it could be club delivery, or it could be all those together. But I have a very direct plan, and boy, you can get traction. And once you get traction, it sort of feeds on itself. It's very exciting. It's a lot of fun. And there's no reason why you can't get better. There's no reason in the world why you can't better get better. So I really respect the fact that motor learning is about you having a relationship with yourself in a golf environment to figure out the best way that you can get that club face moving as efficiently as possible to get contact and control and trajectory, to have creativity like James up in the short game. How do you get that ball under your control around the greens and then just be able to transfer it on the golf course? Very important. I think uh, Laird's going to touch on this. I know Liam will as well. The technology here is out of this world, but technology is there to support you and provide you with feedback. Don't be totally reliant on then it becomes a negative. So don't let it be a negative. Use this facility sort of the way it's designed to be used. So without any further ado, I'll pass over to, to you, Larry, and we'll come back and have questions. But I guess the key message here is you can get better, you will get better if you support yourself with good ideas and people around you that guide you, and then make it fun. Make it fun and practice with, uh, with a good purpose. First thing in the big three is driving. The second thing is putting, pardon me, driving, putting, and we call it, it's not really a word, we call it wedging. So it's wedge play. So it's primary wedges, pitching, chipping, flopping, sand play. So if you spend your energy where it makes the most, where you get the most return, you'll be better off. Uh, coming in here for three months and working on your two iron shot <laughs> might not be your best use of time. We, we would see that. We would see people that, believe it or not, do things that where they spend hours and hours on something that would make very little difference in the overall slice of the golf pie. So I'll pass over to you, Larry.
much, everybody. My name is Laird Wright. I, I just have to say, uh, Henry and Liam, thank you very, very much. Uh, Liam's vision here in Canada and what he's done with the Golf Lab is truly, truly magnificent. As a Canadian sales representative for Trackman, I travel coast to coast. There is one facility like this in our country. We're standing here today. So, Liam, congratulations on your successes. Henry, it's a tremendous honor to be uh, standing up here and, and uh, speaking with my mentor. Uh, I worked on Henry's team for a number of years, and uh, we were uh, our part of projects where we built the Catalyst Center over at Eagle's Nest and, uh, and uh, had a lot of fun together. So, this is a, a great honor for me to speak to you today. Uh, this is a picture of Luke Donald. And I want to pose a question to the group. And really, how is Luke McDonald different than any of us? Other than the obvious, which is the private jet, and the tour wife, and the bank account. <laughs> Other than the major stuff, why do you think Luke McDonald's ball responds differently than maybe our ball? Repeatable swing. Okay. The right equipment. Anybody else have any other suggestions? Instructors, absolutely, and uh, they play a major role on uh, on that journey. There's no question. Um, we're going to talk about things really today that matter most to the golf ball. What the ball responds to, and I can assure you that Luke Donald's ball does not care that he's sponsored by Polo Ralph Lauren or that he wears visors every time he plays. He, the ball responds only to the delivery of the golf ball. And that's where I'm going to spend my time and energy talking about. So, some key impact variables. Club path, club face, a term called attack angle, centeredness of hit or smash factor, and speed. So what is club path? Club path is really the direction, the sweet spot of the golf club is moving when it collides with the golf ball. Path can be referenced either at the target, left of the target, or right of the target. And according to TrackMan, Positive means the club is traveling to the right. This is regardless of the left or right-handed player. And negative means to the left. So let's look at some examples. How many people in here hit the ball relatively straight at their target? Come on, a little bit more, hopefully. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is a picture of Camilo Vijegas. And Camilo, if you look at the blue line, this blue overlay that you can see right here, this club is traveling virtually in the direction of this target. And it's quantified here with a minus 0.6, 6 tenths of a degree off, off that target. So Camilo's club itself is traveling in the direction of the target when it collides with the golf ball. That is a great thing. It doesn't mean the ball is flying at his target yet. We're just talking club path right now. This is a gentleman who had tremendous success on the nationwide tour named Michael Sidney. You can see 2.8 degrees positive, which means this club itself is moving marginally to the right of the target. Who here plays a little bit of a draw shot? Those of you would do that if you're right-handed players. Show of hands, who here is struggling with slicing the golf ball? The root of the cause is the club itself traveling to the left of the target. Uh, when you say a degree of variation, what are you referencing? The standard deviation. Minus one, plus one, Oh, what, what's a level of acceptance yeah. for us, would you suggest? Yeah. I would say in my studies, uh, plus or minus three degrees one side or the other. That's just my own opinion, and that's my experience where I've seen to date. In truth, in looking for these slides, uh, let me just backtrack a little bit. It was easy to find tour players who were moving their club directly down the target line, and it was easy to find tour players that moved their club slightly to the right of target. It was difficult for me to find tour players doing this. This is a gentleman I was lucky enough to work with, and we know you know him. It's a tough image, it's Andrew Legend. And uh, this was out in Vancouver when I was out there a couple of weeks ago. Okay, so let's do a little club path review. Club path really is it, it can be moving at the target, left of the target, or right of the target when the club collides with the golf ball. What I suggest is that club path itself 
really determines where the position of the club face needs to be for you to hit a successful golf shot. So, for example, if your path is constantly traveling to the left of the target, for, you, for your ball to arrive at your intended target, you need the club face to be slightly open. So let's talk a little bit about club face. Club face is the orientation of the face when it collides with the golf ball in relation to the target. And again, plus and minus applies the same way. This is Jeff pointing. And you can see that his club face on impact is literally pointing right down that target line. We'll look at later slides that will match his path and face, and we'll find out what kind of shot he has. So when you start talking about club path and club face, you now have to look at the relationship between the two. They're correlated. So there's a new variable called face to path. And that's really the orientation of the club face relative to the path. And in this example, if you look here, you can see the club face is pointing just marginally left of that club path. Hence the term minus 0.8. Okay, so let's have a little bit of a QA. I've now put the red overlay, which is Milo Vijegas' club, club face marginally to the right of the path. Assuming center contact, how would this ball fly? center contact, this ball will start and move to the right. Face is open to the path, which is why that ball is banking to the right. Here's another image of Michael Sim. You can see the blue arrow, his club path is traveling marginally out to the right, and his club face is pointing just slightly to the left. What kind of shot would this produce? Draw. Assuming center contact. Draw. Yes, absolutely. So his face is slightly closed to the direction of his club. Here's Jeff Winnie. Okay. Assuming center <coughs> contact, what kind of ball flight will we see? Face down and How's this? Uh, I can assure you, this is rarely seen. <laughs> and I must give props to our good friend, Andrew Ross, who uh, sent this in to me just last week. And uh, this was actually his brother, uh, Chris. And uh, the amount of times I've seen 0, .0 club pass, 0, 0.0 face angle, that ball started. Well, first of all, face to path is square. That ball started online, and the, the spin axis was zero. That ball moved straight, stayed straight, and landed seven tenths of the target offline. <laughs> Can we hit a straight shot? Very difficult. Is it attainable? Absolutely. Okay, so I want you to answer these questions. How do you hit a straight shot? What three things need to happen? Path, face, and center contact in the club face. Can you coach yourselves when utilizing the technology that Liam has provided? If you know just to look for those few parameters. So here's the challenge. Based on your current club delivery characteristics, can you create the appropriate feelings Make your ball fly straighter. Absolutely. So we're talking curvature. Who wants distance? Okay. So here's a variable that affects distance, especially with the driver. This is now talking about vertical, up and down. So the positive is a reference to up. The club's traveling up when it flies with the golf ball or the negative number would be the club traveling down. Now, I've deliberately not included a, a parameter that goes in conjunction with this. <coughs> and it's called dynamic loft, or the delivered loft of the golf club. I'll, I'll reference it a little bit later, but it, please know that it goes hand in hand with this. Okay, so here's some information for you to be aware of. On the LPGA Tour, they hit up on the ball by an average of three degrees. The PGA Tour, they're actually hitting down on the golf ball with their driver, even though the majority of club hitters in the room will tell us all to hit up on the ball. Why do you think the PGA Tour hits down versus the LPGA up, or even, frankly, the Remax Lower Guidelines? Accurate control. They're going for control, and the Tour players have enough speed to 
they have the luxury of getting down for that control. Most of us in this room may not have that uh, opportunity. I'll put myself in the uh, which in first and foremost. So you can see that these long drive fellas, they kick way up on the ball, zero to up, and then PGA Tour is marginally down. I mean, we're talking just about a degree. Okay. So, some of us in this room may have 90 miles an hour of club head speed. What if I told you, with 90 miles an hour speed, and if you were hitting down on the ball, we could, with a little bit of coaching support, probably highly likely a bit of club fitting, we could get you 25 yards of extra distance without changing your club speed. <coughs> Here's how we do it. So, if you take a look at the effects of attack angle, here's a reference point, negative 5, 0 or level, and up. So we always say that a positive attack angle has five major benefits. And the first is in, in increasing club head speed, an increase in launch angles, a decrease in spin, but you don't care about those three things, all you care about is hitting the ball, carrying the ball upwards of 215 with not, uh, 90 miles an hour, and rolling it out to about 240. That 25 yard gain is tremendous. And that's not because how did they get to the gym or see Dr. Nick for that matter. That's just by changing your club delivery characteristics. I must admit that if you, if you went from a, a five degree down attack angle and worked it up into a plus five, you're definitely doing a driver thing. Your driver character, characteristics will change. Henry talked about maxing out in driving distance. Uh, actually, let me just go back for a second. By the way, I showed a picture of Luke Donald. That's Luke Donald's ball flight right there. He carried the ball 270 yards. The yellow ball flight is Kevin Streelman with less club head speed. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. Seriously. I, I will make sure Liam has that, that comparison and that you can look at it. Luke Donald has about 111 miles an hour speed. Kevin Streelman about 110. Strowman hits up on the ball by three degrees, Luke Donald by, down by a degree, and there's a, on the, this particular comparison, there's a 30 yard difference. Here's another comparison. Hard to see a little bit. This is a fellow by the name of Marcus Breer. Marcus is an Austrian player. Uh, amazing story. About, uh, how long ago? A couple of years ago, he and his coach went to Trackman head office, and uh, Marcus was on the brink of losing his PGA Tour card, or European, European Tour card. And so you can see here, March 20th, 2011 was the very beginning. They created a baseline, which is what Henry recommended. He had 109 miles an hour speed. Attack angle hit down on the ball by a couple of degrees. There's his ball speed, launch angle, flight characteristics. Really, more importantly, he's carrying the ball 250 miles, 250 yards. <coughs> he and his coach create a game plan. Six months later, they've changed their attack angle from two degrees down to three degrees up, actually dropped club head speed, and is now hitting the ball over 275 yards. He went from being on the brink of losing his tour card to in 2012 won this year on the European team. Or not seen this year, on the European team. So there's a, an example of the effects of an attack angle. You can see it here in blue, the club's traveling down marginally by a couple of degrees. Areas that was just like, yeah. And us as coaches, we can look at things as to why he's now hitting up on the ball. You know, if uh, the images were better, you might see, you know, he's a little bit more on top of the ball, he's more, maybe he's more spine angle tilt, things of that nature. The ball doesn't care. I can tell you that for sure. Okay, so these players make great contact. It's almost a, the chicken or the egg. Do they make great contact? because they deliver the club to the ball this way, or is it the opposite? I think that if we can move our club in the direction of our target, with a club face that's square to target, with a driver that's moving up, I think we're gonna find pretty decent contact, more often than we don't. And so the term smash factor is really <coughs> how solid you hit the ball. And just to use easy numbers, 100 miles an hour can equate to a 150 mile an hour ball speed if you hit the dead center. If that 1.50 number drops, we as coaches and you as players should know that contact is jeopardized ever so slightly. So, uh, let me get it. Well, okay. well, I'll wrap this up with a, a neat challenge or a, or a, a bold statement. Clubhead speed, correct me 
measures it just prior to impact. And here's some parameters that you can take a look at. The highest reported covet speed in history, 150 miles an hour. That is faster than the LPGA Tour ball speed average. <laughs> I don't know if anybody was watching when Jimmy Sandusky was on the Golf Channel and he put the ball through the simulator. Yeah. That's why.
basic fundamental is understand how that piece of technology works. You know, it, it's important for you to understand that a launch monitor is using radar to track actual ball flight. It's important to understand not only how it works, but what its limitations are. Um, you know, when we go through and we talk about the different 3D sensors, or for those of you that maybe have the iPing app and you're clipping your iPhone out on your putter and going and working on drills, understand at least at a basic level how those gyroscopes inside are tracking that movement, and you're going to be able to better interpret <coughs> the data, what's valuable, what's not valuable. <coughs> Once we understand a little bit about how it works, and one of the most important things that I can encourage everybody out there to do, understand what the limitations are. You know, the technology is not going to make you better, it's how you apply the feedback that the technology gives you and incorporate that into your training. Start with the cameras. You know, video has been around golf for nearly 20 years now. You know, gone are the days where we had two VCRs stacked on top of each other and a dry erase marker on the TV. But one of the things that you know I feel is very important for people, whether you're training on video in here or whether you're just taking your your phone or your camera out to the driving range and recording your golf swing, the single most important thing to get quality information from 2D video analysis is the location of the if you're taking your camera out to the driving range and you simply want to just track your swing over time and monitor changes, maybe you're playing really good and I want to see what that looks like, be sure that you are very rigid in your camera setup. Make sure that, you know, if you want it to be 10 feet behind you and in line with your trail elbow, make sure it's there every time. If you're going to do face on camera work, make sure that it's in line with your sternum every time. If you go home and you turn on YouTube and you're going to take a look at Luke Donald's swing and you see a camera that's over top of the ball <coughs> as opposed to in line with his trail arm, you need to understand that the optics associated with the curvature of a monocular lens are going to skew your perception of certain points throughout the swing. So maybe don't look at finite technical skills, maybe just take a look at some big picture items. Uh, if you're going anywhere to have your putter tested or take a look at your putting stroke, be sure that that professional that you're working with takes your putter, checks the lie, checks the loft, and checks the length. All of those are critical pieces of information for any device to give you accurate feedback. If you don't give the right parameters to the device, you can be sure the feedback you get is going to be erroneous, and then you run the risk of actually getting worse as opposed to getting better. Uh, when we talk about 3D motion capture, this is something that we're very active in here. It, this is how we evaluate the motor patterns that Henry was speaking of. So, you need to understand the type of system you are. What are the limitations of feedback? One of the systems that we use in here is called KBEST. It's three degrees of freedom. You don't really need to know what that means. All we know from that is it's not going to tell you if you're early extending. It's not going to tell you if you're hanging back. It's not going to tell you if you're sliding through the golf ball. It will tell you, however, if you have an efficient sequence to generate speed, which obviously we've all learned today is very important. One of the things that is very important, I wanted to touch on this because there's probably a few of you out here that have devices like the Swing Byte or the Swing Science. Understand how these work and again how important they are to have installed properly. They're what's called snap calibrated. So if you're looking at, say, feedback from one of these types of devices for, say, face angle, if you have this even twisted two degrees <coughs> off to one side, you're going to get back bad data. If you're going to hit a shot, you're going to see back there on your iPhone, you're going to watch the golf ball do one thing, it's going to be contradictory to what Laird has just taught you, and then you're going to start to develop poor motor patterns, which obviously is not a good thing. Uh, so anytime you're using this, take the time to make sure you set the device up properly and understand how it works. <laughs> I thought I'd bring everybody back. You can see if we properly calibrate our technology, it's probably going to make a few pots. I'm going to talk, I, you know, today was uh, called the do's and don'ts of training with technology, so I want to talk a little bit about the don'ts. One of the things that just drives me crazy when I walk down and check up and see how our members are doing is when I see someone up there hitting balls, they turn around, and they've got 16 data points on the screen. I have no idea what it is you're looking at, but please just stop. Pick one thing, maybe two. Pick something that's relevant. Pick something that fits with the types of changes that you're trying to make. And then go with, you know, just go with that. You don't need to look at 
well, what was my, what was my club path, my basic path, my angle of attack, my spin axis, my dynamic lock, my spin lock, my left wrist position at the top of the backswing, and my right knee position at the downswing. You're going nowhere. You're going nowhere real fast. Your handicap's probably going to go up a few points. So strip it down, keep it to a bare minimum. The human brain can only remember seven digits, and that's, you know, for 30 seconds within our short-term memory before that becomes stored. And one of the things I'm going to start to talk about a little bit later again is this data presentation. And when Laird was showing values up there, everything was at least two numbers. Your club path was 3.4, or it was negative 2.1. We always like to see people have two, and certainly no more than three data points presented to them any time on a launch monitor. Anything more than that, and you just can't make sense of it, you're going to induce confusion unto yourself, and you're going to inhibit yourself from developing new and better motor patterns. Be sure to match the type of feedback that you're looking at to your learning style. If you know that you're a visual learner, set the launch monitor up so it says carry distance, distance offline and then use the video feedback so you can start to equate okay, this is what I felt this is what really happened this is what the ball did incorporate that into the next swing and move on about positive progress if you're like me and you're more of a numbers type of guy then put up the club path or the basic path or the angle of attack or whatever it is that correlates to whatever the skill is that you're trying to work on in here we're very lucky that we have different pieces of technology that will cater to everybody's learning style. If you don't have one of those, I would recommend that you stay away from the technology and work on the kinesthetic feel and let the ball play be your guide. Relevance, pretty important. Again, we see so many people in here that are trying to fix their slice, but then when we go and we take a look at the information that they're presenting to themselves, they've got angle of attack up on the screen. It's not going to help them make a difference. Take the information that you've got from there, understand it, incorporate it into your own practice routine, and you're going to accelerate faster. Feedback is critical, but we're only going to make positive progress if we have relevant feedback <coughs> to what our goals are. This skill acquisition pyramid applies to every single one of us at every level of development. Whether you're a high-level amateur or professional player working on a new shot, for me it would be trying to fade the ball. To start when I'm working on trying to hit a fade, I'm thinking about everything. Where am I aiming? Is my grip going to be okay? Okay, am I going to be able to deliver this club with a leftward path? You can use the pieces of technology that we have in here to help you stay focused on the most important task at hand. The sooner that we start to eliminate all these sources of confusion, the sooner we're going to progress up through that pyramid of skill acquisition and ultimately get to a point where we can perform these skills automated under pressure. And that's when we're really going to see the results. Whether pressure for you is out there on Sunday morning playing with your buddies or whether it's going to be next year back at the Canadian Open. out there. 
swing mechanic, one you know, club delivery metric, and we focus on one outcome variable. Where did that ball start? You're going to be more effective at transferring that outside in the season. You're training yourself to react the same way that you would outdoors. If you're working on reducing spin, changing launch angle, I want to see well, what was the true loft of my golf club. Just because my driver says it's 10.5 degrees, where was the loft really there at impact? And then the, the correlating value we want to understand there is how did the ball actually take off? And this is going to start to train your eye. You're going to get the feedback for, the, yes, I delivered the club the way I want to. The ball took off like this. This is exactly what I want to see. It's going to train my eye to see that. When you get outside, when you get away from the technology, you're going to be much more effective at reading and reacting and being a problem solver live on the golf course. One of the things that Henry talked about earlier is you know, technology can be detrimental to us if used incorrectly. We will become reliant. And when you get out on the golf course, you'll be lost and you won't know how to fix it. And that's one of the things that we work very hard in here to guard against. Uh, face the path and spin axis. If you just simply want to reduce the curvature of the golf ball, then you need to understand First and foremost, that face has to be squared to the path. Whether it's a push or a pull, doesn't matter. If that face is heading the same direction the golf club is traveling in, then you're going to be hitting straight shots. Spin axis, for those of you who don't know, is the actual axis of the rotation of the golf ball, and that's what causes the ball to bank in one direction or the other. The last point that I want to touch on for people when you're in here training, too often I see individuals out there in one of our hitting bays working on acquiring a skill and they're treating each shot as its own single occurrence. I always want to see people train for their patterns. So shut all the data off. Go out there. Hit 15 shots with your 7 iron. Go into the analyze screen and start to spot patterns. Understand what your tendencies are. When you understand more about your tendencies, you'll be able to manage your game better, put yourself in a better position on the golf course, and ultimately get that ball